Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator this evening. Tonight we're joined by Dr. Colt Barber for her review of how to identify the most common oral pathologies observed within CBT, CBCT scans. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled have a question on the right side of your screen. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Welcome again and thank you for being with us tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Hi, so thank you so much for spending your evening with me. I'm really excited to be talking about common radiographic oral pathologies that you might see in your office, in your CBCTs. And um, I do appreciate your time. I know how busy this season is especially, so thank you for spending your evening with me. And hopefully it'll be super fun and exciting. All right, just some um, speaker disclosures. I'm the founder and managing oral maxillofacial radiologist for Dental Radiology Diagnostics, which is a CBCT reading website, and drdxdocs.com, which is an educational radiology website. I'm also a 3D trainer and key opinion leader for uh, Dental Place Serona, Henry Schein, Patterson Dental, and CDOCS. And I'm adjunct professor at uh, UNC Chapel Hill and um, I just joined as really assistant adjunct professor, the general diagnostic radiology department in the School of Medicine at Loma Linda University. And I help out the neuroradiology group there. Um, all right, so some objectives that we're gonna talk about today is how to describe the radiographic appearance of the most common oral pathologies you might see in your office. We wanna talk about the various categories of disease um, based on the radiographic signs of what you're seeing? And then how do we manage some of those common radiographic pathologies in your office? And so I put this together looking at um, some of our cysts, our benign tumors, um, lesions of bone, things like that, that perhaps you don't quite remember from dental school days because that was a long time ago and you probably are seeing them in your office. We're going off of our radiographic signs. So these are the radiographic signs that we're looking at. Uh, we have seven of them. Radiographic density, marginal characteristics, the shape of the lesion, the location and distribution of the lesion, the size of the lesion, internal architecture, and effects on surrounding tissues. And you can see that two of them are highlighted. And that's because they are the most important as far as letting us know how aggressive a particular entity is. So you really wanna pay attention to the marginal characteristics and the effects on surrounding tissues. What are they doing to the surrounding tissues? All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and start with this line down here. We're gonna start with cysts. When we're looking at our categorization of diseases, the very first thing that we typically want to determine is something normal versus abnormal. And when we decide ah, something doesn't quite look like, right, we wanna think of the most common things first. And so the most common things we might see might be something developmental or congenital, could be something that's acquired, um, such as trauma and inflammation. But as dentists, we're really good at determining trauma and inflammation. And I think the ones that we get a little bit more hung up on is the cysts, fibrosseous lesions of bone, and um, benign versus malignant tumor. So that's really what I wanna talk about today. So some of our typical features of cysts, of course, they're going to be in the tooth bearing regions. Um, they're above the mandibular canal. They can freely expand into the sinuses. And most of our pathologies do like to expand uh, following the path of least resistance. So expanding into the sinuses is something they do like to do. A cyst will have very well-defined and corticated borders, but if they are secondarily infected, they can lose that beautiful cortication and we get more of a sclerotic bone pattern. We get those typical signs that we would get with any type of inflammation. So when we're thinking about cysts, they do tend to look kind of like a balloon, very hydrostatic in appearance. Um, very uh, like fluid filled, I would say, typically round or oval, but there are some cysts that may have scalloped orders. We even have some that might be multilocular. 
So we'll talk about those. Internally, they tend to be radiolucent internally. When we're talking about this as far as cone beam CT, we'll talk about it in terms of density. So if it's radiolucent, it is hypodense. And typically that's hypodense to the surrounding structures. Um, we can have dystrophic calcifications in long-standing cysts. So anytime you have a long-standing cyst, a dystrophic calcification could occur internally. If we have a multilocular cystic entity, it will have septations within it. And they do like to cause things like tooth displacement, occasionally some sort of root resorption of the surrounding dentition, expansion of cortical borders, and they will displace the inferior alveolar nerve inferiorly. So we're going to pay attention to where that nerve goes because that kind of can help us with the pathologies we're seeing. So here's a beautiful example of our cyst. Now this is called a residual cyst. So as you remember from dental school days when the tooth has been extracted, um, but you still have a radicular cyst that's left behind, it is now called a residual cyst. And what you can see very nicely with this is it's very well-defined and corticated. We have this nice white line around it. And what's happened is the body's been able to wall this off. And so we have our disease tissue right next to healthy tissue. So we can say this is well-defined and corticated. It's um, definitely hydrostatic in appearance and lets us know we have a residual cyst. Moving on to our incisive canal cysts. Our incisive canal cysts are a remnant of the, of the notochord, the embryonic remnant um, that is left behind and starts to proliferate. And we can end up with a cystic process. Now, of course, when we're looking at this in 2D, Sometimes we see this beautiful heart-shaped appearance. Um, this is a nice occlusal film. You can see a large, well-defined corticated hypodensity. But when we're looking with our CBCTs, it's so easy to tell what this is because it's located within the canal. And it looks like we've put a water balloon or a grape within that canal. And so we have that nice hydrostatic appearance with intact cortical borders. <laughs> Excuse me. So here's a beautiful example of a nasopalatine duct cyst. And again, we want to make sure that it is within the canal. So in our 3D images, we will check where the canal is and try to determine if it's located within it. If it's located outside of the canal, we're going to start to think about other pathologies. Um, now, one of the things I do want to mention with the nasopalatine duct cysts and this one looks very hydrostatic, so it's very easy to tell, but occasionally we might be unsure whether we do have a cyst or not. And we don't always have all of the nice palatal bone that we would like to have there. Sometimes you see kind of a, a nondescript expansion. So if you're looking in your axial sections and your um, incisive canal is larger than six millimeters in diameter, it could mean that you have a cystic process. In that case, I always go to my sagittal sections and see if it looks hydrostatic. But if you're not quite sure, we can always reevaluate this patient in about six to 12 months. One of the things I do want to mention is our, na our nasopalatine duct cysts are very, very slow growing cysts. So it does take some time for you to see a differentiation. And what we're looking for is an enlargement of that incisive canal. We want to see that there's been a growth potential uh, before we go ahead and call it, if it is uncertain. Um, but of course, this particular case, it's very hydrostatic. So this is definitely a nasopalatine duct cyst. All right, let's talk about another entity. Um, in this particular CBCT, you can see an expansile lesion in the posterior maxilla. And what you'll notice is the tooth is displaced. In fact, that might be the first sign that something is wrong, um, is that the third molar or the individual tooth does not erupt. And that tends to be the reason that some of these CBCTs are taken, especially if we're talking about the younger population. 
we can see that the tooth has been displaced into the sinus. And now we need to decide if this is something that is of odontogenic origin or if it's coming from the sinus. And the reason being is that we'll decide how we describe this. So if I think that whatever this entity is, is coming from the sinus, I would compare it to the tissues in the sinus and we could say, oh, this is hyperdense to the air-filled sinus. But if it's coming up from the alveolar bone, you can see it's definitely hypodense or radiolucent in comparison to the surrounding bone. So understanding where this particular entity is coming from will help us when we go to describe it. But this we can definitely see is a displaced tooth with a well-defined and I would say corticated hypodensity around the crown of that tooth. And it seems to go from or DEJ to DEJ. And that's a hallmark feature of our dentigerous cyst. Now, there are other things we could have on this differential. Really, we're looking at it radiographically. Sometimes when they look at it histologically, they actually see that the lining of the cyst is attaching further down on that tooth, which would be a red flag that it's something else. And so other things that we can also think about are an odontogenic keratocyst, and that is something we might see here, or maybe even a small unicystic ameloblastoma. So those are other things you might have on your differential. Here we can see it in all three planes. And what happens is we get this fluid accumulation between the crown and the epithelial lining, or within the uh, reduced epithelial enamel um, and it starts to kind of blow up like a balloon. We get this hydrostatic pressure. And so we can see that we definitely have a large expansile hypodensity. We're saying it's hypodense to the surrounding bone. We can have thinning of those cortical borders as well, and sometimes even erosion through those cortical borders. Sometimes we can even have an oral communication. If you have an oral communication, we could get a secondarily infected integerous cyst, in which case you would lose that beautiful corticated appearance and you'd get kind of a thickened sclerotic looking appearance to it. Now sometimes our dentigerous cysts are not symmetrically positioned around the crown of a tooth. Sometimes they can be slightly asymmetric and that's the case with this particular entity. So here we see a large well-defined, partially corticated radiolucency in the posterior mandible. And when we look at it in all three planes, we can see we have extensive expansion and thinning of the cortical borders. Now, sometimes it looks like we've lost cortical borders, and that's because, especially with the extensive amount of expansion, um, we can have very, very thin cortical borders. And we have something with CBCT called partial volume averaging. So within each little voxel space or 3D pixel, it will average out the gray values. So if we have a very thin cortical border, it may be difficult for us to see it in our CBCTs. It doesn't mean it's not there. Um, so for example, this is a great example here. When we're looking at the axial sections, you might say, I'm not really following that cortical border. And yet when we look at it in the coronal sections, we can see that we do have a thin but intact cortical border. Um, other thing I do want to mention is that dentigerous cysts really like to expand. So if I'm trying to decide between a dentigerous cyst versus an odontogenic keratocyst, I know that a dentigerous cyst is much more likely to expand where the odontogenic keratocysts will um, have very minimal expansion for the size of that particular entity. So if I see gross expansion, I'm gonna be thinking more about a dentigerous cyst, especially if it's related to the crown of a tooth. All right, moving on to our lateral periodontal cysts. And we can get um, these little cystic entities within the uh, rests, the periodontal rests of malaise, and we can get these little cystic processes. One of the things with our lateral periodontal cysts that I do want to mention 
is it is associated with the little rest within the peritoneal ligament space, but they're also very, very tiny. They're typically very small when we find them. Um, tend to be small, well-defined, corticated, um, unilocular. In fact, this is one of the reasons we want to look at our cortical borders as we're coming through our sections. So when I go down through my axial sections, I always look at my cortical borders. And you can see that we have a thin, expanded cortical border in this area. <clears throat> if you're not sure what you're looking at, you can always put your crosshairs on it and look at it in all three planes. And you'll notice that, yes, in our coronal section, it does look like we have a small cyst with expansion and thinning of the buccal cortical border. Now, again, these can be very, very small. We're talking about maybe two millimeters in diameter. So they're very easy to um, go ahead and remove those and send those for histology. But occasionally we can have a variation of a lateral periodontal cyst, and that's called a botryoid cyst or grape-like cyst. And this is one of our multilocular cysts. And so you can see multiple of these little loculations. that are at the um, interradicular region between the teeth. Uh, typically, these are up the midroot region and superior aspect when we're looking at um, the location along the root as well. But when we see these little multilocular ones, the beautiful grape ones, these are botryoid cysts, and these are always fun to see. All right, moving on, we're going to look at some cysts in our pediatric population. And one of the things that comes to mind is something called the buccal bifurcation cyst. This also can be caused by the uh, periodontal rests um, within the buccal aspect of that tooth. And we get kind of a little cystic process. Now we tend to see them in younger individuals. Obviously this is a pediatric patient. And most commonly within the buccal aspect of the first molars. Now, it's not uncommon for it to be bilateral. So especially if you see it bilateral, you want to think about buccal bifurcation cysts. The other thing that you'll note is that it will displace the tooth. And so you might notice, for instance, that the lingual cusps erupt first. So it will displace the roots uh, lingually and the crown buccally. And so because we have that angle, you might notice that these lingual um, cusps are the first ones to erupt and the tooth looks very displaced. And of course, when you get your CBCT, you can see a very well-defined corticated cystic entity along the buccal aspect of that tooth. Let's see if I have another one now. That's the one I have. Okay. Um, one of the things I do want to mention with these is they can be removed without removing the tooth. So the tooth does not need to be removed. The cysts have an epithelial lining and they can be nicely removed, saving the teeth. And I think that's kind of the take home message of this one is that you don't have to extract the tooth. So definitely keep that in mind. All right, moving on to another one. And this is kind of an interesting one. This is called a surgical ciliated cyst. And our keys here is that the patient has a history of orthognathic surgery. So we can see we do have some hardware going on. Patient has a history of orthognathic surgery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what can happen is that the respiratory epithelium can actually get trapped within the alveolar bone and it starts to proliferate. So if I'm looking at this, how do I know I'm not just looking at a sinus septation? How do I know that's something more? Well, a couple of clues, uh, for instance, in this particular case, we do see some expansion of this entity into the inferior lateral aspect of the nasal fossa. Uh, we do have uh, thinning and expansion of cortical borders as well. So as we're going through this, you might say, oh, maybe that's just a sinus septation with a mucosal thickening. <clears throat> but one of the things that leads us to not think that is we do see the displacement of cortical borders and thinning of cortical borders. So you can see it's kind of expanding into that infralateral aspect of the nasal fossa. And as you go through, you can also see thinning and expansion through the palatal bone. 
So this would not be something that you would see if it was just a normal sinus septation with a mucosal thickening. This tells us, yes, we do have a pathology in this particular area. We're seeing a mass effect to it. And of course, patient has their history of orthognathic surgery. And so we would think about in this case would be a surgical ciliated cyst. All right, moving on to our simple bone cysts. Uh, this particular entity has had many names throughout its lifetime. Uh, one of the most common has been simple bone cyst. Previously, it was a traumatic bone cyst. They used to think that this had some sort of association with trauma, uh, which that was quickly disproved. And uh, then they called it simple bone cyst. But the interesting key with this is that it is not epithelial lined. It is really um, just an empty cavity within the bone. So not epithelial lined, so it's not a true cyst. So now it's been renamed idiopathic bone cavity. Idiopathic meaning we really don't know why, but the child or the, the young individual develops a bone cavity. And the keys with this is it's well-defined, and we might say partially corticated, but it definitely has a delicate border, and it likes to scallop between the roots of the teeth. Now, it does not cause any apical root resorption, really very minimal expansion. And sometimes when we're looking at these, we're wondering, am I just seeing an enlarged marrow space or I'm actually seeing some sort of pathology going on? And again, we can look at those cortical borders. So if you see scalloping of these cortical borders, we know, yes, we do have something that's occupying this space. I'm seeing thinning of the cortical border. Now there's no real expansion to those cortical borders. We just have thinning of it. And that lets us know, yes, we do have something that's occupying this space. But in this case, it happens to be an empty bone cavity. Now, the key with this is once the oral surgeon opens up into it, they typically know exactly what it is because it's an empty cavity. And just by curetting it and causing it to bleed, you have effectively healed it and the bone will go ahead and fill in. So if you're going to have a pathology, this is definitely the one you're going, you're going to want to have if you have to have one. Um, it's the simplest to fix and uh, really has beautiful results afterwards. So not a true cystic process. All right, moving on to our odontogenic keratocyst. And this has gone back and forth. The World Health Organization has at times um, termed it a cyst and at other times called it a tumor. And why is that? Well, it's because it can have various spectrums of uh, presentations. Some might be more aggressive than others. Uh, there is um, the possibility to have daughter cysts within the lining, and so it can recur. And so sometimes it's been termed more of a tumor than a cyst because it can recur. Um, the interesting thing with this is it tends to be very, very large by the time it is noticed. And you can see here we have this large, well-defined, corticated, multilocular appearance. And it's actually a fairly large lesion. But yeah, when we look at it with our CBCT, we look at it in all three planes, you'll notice that, yes, it's very large, but there's very minimal expansion when I compare it to the other side. And that's because this particular entity likes to grow along the endosteal surfaces with very minimal expansion. So these can be quite large by the time they're actually noticed. Um, they are very common. So it is extremely common to see this in your dental practice. Um, let's see. It will displace the mandibular canal inferiorly. It will not cause any root resorption to it. Um, yeah, let's see what else do you want to talk about. It may displace the teeth, but it's kind of a a very, very common entity. And we can usually say it's more common in the posterior mandible, but it really can be anywhere. And so, you know, if you see a small, well-defined hypodensity or radiolucent lesion, um, it's nicely corticated with minimal expansion. This is something that should be on your list because it is very common to see. And there we can see it with the mandibular canal mapped as well. Now, occasionally we do see odontogenic keratocysts in a much younger population. 
Yeah, they can. They can be anywhere at any time in any age group, it's true. But sometimes we see them in the pediatric population. And in this particular case, you'll notice that it is associated with some unerupted teeth. And we have multiple of these. And they almost look like they're dentigerous cysts. Um, and again, remember that an aden a dentigerous cyst and an odontogenic cratocyst can be on each other's differentials. Uh, one of the things that you'll see again is the dentigerous cyst is more likely to expand. But if you see multiple of them, we tend to start thinking about multiple OKCs. Again, we can see multiple of these lesions. I've actually got one up here as well. There's the little third molar crown, a pediatric population. And we start to think about something called a basal cell nevus syndrome. And it has various names. You may have learned it as Gorl and Goltz syndrome or nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. And again, we're looking at a younger population, multiple lesions. They can also have basal cell carcinomas on the um, neck and face, and they can have uh, various abnormalities as well, skeletal abnormalities such as missing ribs, fusion, bifid ribs, that sort of thing. So there's a whole syndrome that goes with it. Now, these particular OKCs are actually more aggressive than we see if you just have a singular one outside of the syndrome, and they do tend to recur. So with these cases, um, you do need to monitor them radiographically, um, at least in the beginning, I might do six months to a year, and that can kind of lengthen out over time. But obviously you can see multiple of these, and it's not a fun entity to have, um, particularly in a young individual. But you'll do notice that they do look a lot like little dentigerous cysts. Now, could you have multiple dentigerous cysts? Well, of course you can. <laughs> Uh, there's something called marital Lamy syndrome that we're not going to talk about. And I think that was one of our radiology board questions. But on the whole, if you see multiple of these, think about multiple OKCs. All right, moving on to fiber osseous and lesions of bone. These tend to be um, things like our fibrous dysplasia. And in this particular case, the normal bone is kind of changed over into fibrous tissue. And then you'll start to see some irregular woven bone within that fibrous tissue. And that gives us a very interesting pattern. So there's lots of different patterns out there. Probably the most common is a ground glass pattern. And you can see expansion of the bone. Um, however, the cortical borders will stay intact. So it's very something that's very important to look at is that yes, fibrous dysplasia tends to occur at a very young age. Um, we can see it within the first decade and um, it can be one bone or many bones. So if it's one bone, we call it monoostotic. If it's multiple bones, it's polyostotic. And in those cases, there could be some association with endocrine issues as well. Um, but when they're monoostotic, which is the one bone, we will see expansion and thinning of cortical borders, but the cortical borders will be intact. And the, the designation with that is very important because 1% of fibrous dysplasias could transition to an osteosarcoma. So you always wanna make sure those cortical borders are intact. Um, we have various patterns, as I said, ground glass being probably the most common, followed maybe by an orange peel pattern or a cotton wool pattern. But occasionally we see some other really fun things. So this was a fingerprint pattern. You can see it really looks like someone took their fingerprint and put it on your x-ray. And of course, this is completely textbook. So I was very excited to see this case. As a radiology geek, this was so awesome. Um, so I'm excited to be able to put that in so you can see the fingerprint pattern. Many times the teeth that are associated with a patient that has fibrous dysplasia will have hypercementosis. And of course, fibrous dysplasia likes to follow the path of least resistance. And so it can easily expand up into the sinuses. The key with this is that it will expand the sinus, but it maintains the shape of that sinus. And again, you'll notice that we do have intact cortical borders. So it's expanded it, but it's maintained that shape. So here's some other examples. And again, many times with this, the first sign is that the teeth haven't erupted. 
And so additional imaging is taken. And you can see we do have expansion of the mandible. On this particular side, we have a nice ground glass appearance to it. And we do have intact cortical borders. They do look thin, but they're intact. So again, very important. Um, let's see what else. It can displace teeth. It will decrease the periodontal ligament size. Again, we talked about the hypercementosis, and it definitely will complicate orthodontic treatment for these patients. Now, one of the other things that we see that's very unique um, with our fibrous dysplasia is that we can get associated cysts within it, or pseudocysts. So simple bone cysts is one of ours we would call a buddy lesion. Um, there's a couple of them. Simple bone cysts is one. Aneurysmal bone cysts we'll talk about later but they like to occur within other lesions. So simple bone cysts you might see within fibrous dysplasia. Um, you can see it within um, osteosarcomas. And you can see it within Florida osseous dysplasia. So our simple bone cysts like to pop up in other things for whatever reason. So if you have a fibrous dysplasia and it's starting to look very radiolucent or hypodense, we know, okay, we've got an associated simple bone cyst. Now, do we do anything about this? And I would say there is mixed research on that. Um, on average, patients that have fiber osseous entities are at increased risk for osteomyelitis. They don't have um, the normal vascular supply that we would see with a typical mandible. And so these patients are at increased risk for infections and osteomyelitis. And so typically we say they're not candidates for implant placement. Uh, we try to make sure that we catch any oral cavities very early on before you have an apical issue. Uh, with a simple bone cyst, we tend to think we're not going to go in and do anything about them. And an interesting thing with these is that those simple bone cysts may spontaneously heal. Um, so that's a very interesting feature with these as well. But there are individuals that like to talk about going in um, to take care of these simple bone cysts on a patient that has fibrous dysplasia. Uh, I personally wouldn't because of the increased risk of osteomyelitis with them. Another key feature with our fibrous dysplasia is it may superiorly displace the mandibular canal. And it's one of the only things that will superiorly displace the mandibular canal. Usually things displace it inferiorly. So this is a hallmark feature, um, very atypical for anything other than fibrous dysplasia. And again, it can expand into the sinuses, but it maintains the shape of that sinus as it expands into it. So <clears throat> now we can get fiber osseous entities at the apices of teeth. And there's actually three stages. Um, in school, we were taught this is preapical osseous dysplasia. And it tends to be at the inferior aspect of the mandibular anterior dentition. But we can also call it preapical osseous dysplasia is if it is located at the apex of one tooth in one particular quadrant. And we used to call that, I think, focal osseous dysplasia is what I learned it as. But they now call that periapical seminal osseous dysplasia or sometimes periapical osseous dysplasia. Sometimes there's a discussion about the cemental component to that. And really, that's more of a histological discussion. But there are three stages we can see in the immature stage. It looks very hypodense or radiolucent and can be easily confused for a periapical lesion. So it's very important to do vitality testing. These teeth are vital. Um, as the lesion progresses and becomes more mature, you start to see a central nidus of hyperdensity. See that right there? And eventually it will completely fill in that particular area with hyperdensity. So in the older population, it, you may not really see the uh, radiolucent or hypodense portion to that. But there's definitely very mixed density in appearance. Again, the teeth are vital. Uh, in school, we learned that this might be associated with a particular demographic. Uh, we learned, uh, you know, perhaps in middle-aged females of Asian or African descent. 
but just know that that demographic is just what's considered the most common. It doesn't mean you're not going to see it in a 70 year old Caucasian male. And so kind of you know, keep an open mind about that. We really look more at the radiographic appearance to it than anything else. So this is an older female that came in and you can see she has multiple of these mixed density entities. They're in the maxilla as well as the mandible. And you'll notice that at this stage, they're very mature and it's largely hyper dense in appearance. We really don't have that radiolucent rim or hypodense rim that we want to see with it. Um, typically our fiber osseous lesions, when we're trying to decide whether it's fiber osseous or not, we'll look for radiolucent rim. Um, that tells us whether we have a fibrous capsule or not. But again, it becomes very difficult as that patient ages. The other thing that you'll notice is as you have alveolar atrophy, these areas of um, irregular bone can become uncovered and they can actually act as sequestrations starting in osteomyelitis. So we tend to see that in the older population as you get alveolar atrophy. All right, florid cemento osseous dysplasia, of course, is what we were just looking at, but it's the same entity, the same fiber osseous entity. It's just if you see it in more than two quadrants or two quadrants or more. So we talked about periapical cemento osseous dysplasia is localized in the anterior mandible or in just one particular quadrant. But if you see it in multiple, it's called florid osseous dysplasia. And again, these patients are at increased risk for osteomyelitis. Um, we, we, we want to be very careful with these particular individuals. And we don't tend to think of them as being <coughs> candidates for implant placement. Um, this particular case uh, was very interesting because the dentist had actually sent it out first to a medical radiology group. And I guess um, the diagnostic imaging center where they had the CBCT taken would automatically come with a read from a medical radiology group. And so in that particular case, he had asked whether he could place implants in this patient. And it came back, of course you can place implants in this patient. These are just bone scars from the teeth being extracted. And uh, my understanding is that he did go ahead and call them back and said, like a second opinion. And they're like, well, what would you be looking for in the jaws? And he said, well, I'm worried about a fiber osseous entity. And unfortunately they said, well, we've never, we never see fiber osseous entities in the jaws, uh, which of course we all know is not true. So you do wanna make sure if you're gonna send this off and you're not sure about it, I would send it off to an oral radiologist. Uh, the same with pathologies. Um, I would send those off to oral pathology because this is the area that we concentrate in. Um, we do see many times things will come back with kind of an interesting um, histological uh, confirmation, especially if they've been sent out to somebody other than um, oral pathology. So sometimes, you know, these cysts can um, look very similar in appearance. And for instance, with a dentigerous cyst, uh, the histologist is really just looking at the epithelial lining, which looks not particularly differentiated for a dentigerous cyst. And that really expands by that hydrostatic pressure. And so they might send something back as a different pathology. Um, so definitely make sure that you stick with oral radiology or oral pathology on this, because unfortunately he went ahead and placed these implants in this patient. And by the time it was sent to us, it was, why does the bone look so funny? And why are the implants loose? And so again, I would say it's very difficult for implants to osseointegrate within the um, kind of, I would say, irregular woven bone. It's not going to osseointegrate correctly within these lesions. And you could see that the implants are placed within these particular lesions. So this is kind of a, a sad case. Um, but we would, on the whole, say these patients are not candidates for implant placement. All right. Here's another example of our florida osseous dysplasia. This one looks a little bit different in appearance. We've got that ground glass appearance. And what you'll notice is you do get expansion and thinning of otherwise intact cortical borders. 
And this is exactly what we would expect from a fiber osseous entity. Now, occasionally we get something that looks just like a fiber osseous entity, but is much more aggressive. And that is our ossifying fibroma. And you might see it as a couple of different names, um, central ossifying fibroma. Sometimes you want to differentiate between a peripheral versus a central ossifying fibroma. Central meaning within the bone. Um, you can see that we definitely have extensive expansion. We do have a ground glass appearance to it. It has a radiolucent rim. So we've got some sort of a soft tissue or fibrous capsule. And we have gross expansion. So what do we do if it's something that is small but looks like this? and we're worried about an ossifying fibroma, uh, we can always watch these and reevaluate them over time. Now, something that's this large, obviously we know it's an ossifying fibroma, and this does need to be removed. So this is on the neoplastic spectrum, and these are removed. But what if it's tiny? What if it's something little like this? Is this an ossifying fibroma, or are we just looking at periapical cemental osseous dysplasia? In this case, we'll go ahead and we'll measure it, we do have a central hyperdense nidus. We have a radiolucent rim and sclerotic border. Looks very much like all of our other benign fiber osseous entities. You see that thinning and expansion of cortical borders, which is very normal. Uh, we can always go ahead and reevaluate this within six to 12 months. And if we have a growth potential, if it has enlarged, then we'll go ahead and say, okay, most likely an ossifying fibroma and we'll have it removed why don't we just biopsy it right away? Well, because all of our fiber osseous entities actually look exactly the same histologically. The differentiation is made with the radiographs. So if you have a small little entity like this and you're not sure quite what to do with it, we can always reevaluate it. And if you see a growth potential, then you can go ahead and have that removed and biopsied. The other thing we might see is a fiber osseous entity at the angle of the mandible. And this tends to be a very, very common place for it. So you'll notice as you're going down through your scan, we have thinning of cortical borders. We have a fiber osseous or ground glass looking entity. We have thinning and expansion of otherwise intact cortical borders. And this is below the mandibular canal. So if it's below the mandibular canal, it's not likely to be odontogenic in origin. And this is our fiber osseous entity, or might term this focal osseous dysplasia um, within the angle of the mandible. And the same thing, you can go ahead and measure that and radiographically reevaluate that within about six to 12 months. But just know this is actually a common area for fiber osseous entities, which I didn't know for the longest time until I went back and took my radiology training. All right, let's talk about other diseases of bone in the jaws. So we can have central giant cell granuloma, cherubism, aneurysmal bone cyst, Paget disease, and Langerhans cell. I'm going to concentrate on the top three right here because they're more commonly what you're going to see in your office. These kind of don't fit anywhere else. They're, there are reactive lesions. They're reacting to something. Um, although cherubism is um, autosomal dominant, the the bony exuberance internally is considered to be um, reactive. All right, so central giant cell granuloma, uh, we tend to see in a younger population. Um, these particular lesions will have these multinucleated giant cells, which is why we get central giant cell granuloma as a name. And one of the key features that you'll notice with this is it tends to have a predilection for the anterior mandible. And it's one of the lesions that will cross the midline. So there's very few lesions that will cross the midline. So that's a special designation. And um, so things like a simple bone cyst will cross the midline. Central giant cell granuloma will cross the midline. Um, malignancies will cross the midline. And there's one other cyst, but we're not going to talk about it. It's a glandular odontogenic cyst. <clears throat> it's a very unusual cyst, which is why we're not talking about it. Um, we get... Um, Somewhat moderately defined borders. We, we tend to think we have very delicate borders to it. And again, that mandibular midline is the most common. And we might also see a little bit of beveling to it. So it's kind of, that's kind of a unique feature to it. Um, but again, 
well-defined but delicate margins, crossing the midline, um, internally, um, hypodense internally, although this looks like it may have kind of a granular type appearance to it. Uh, we have thinning and expansion of the otherwise intact cortical borders. And so kind of a uh, very interesting entity, but it is benign. And again, it tends to be within our younger population. Cherubism, autosomal dominant. Uh, we can see this bilaterally or sometimes in all four quadrants. And we tend to see it in younger individuals between two to six years of age. And one of the reasons I call it cherubism is because the kids usually have cute, puffy little cheeks as we have expansion of these multilocular entities. And it would kind of give them an eyes turned to heaven appearance. And so they look like cute little cherubs. Now the teeth will be displaced um, anteriorly and inferiorly or um, anteriorly and superiorly, depending on if it's the maxillary or mandible. It's definitely very multilocular in appearance. And the bony reaction we see internally is, as I said, reactive in origin, even though this is an autosomal dominant entity to it. And so this is what it looks like with our CBCT. You have multiple of these loculations bilaterally with expansion and thinning of otherwise intact cortical borders. Uh, very common to be bilateral. So that should kind of clue us in on that. Um, now, I, typically we do see some very good resolution in these cases. Um, these lesions will become static and the bone will model over time. Um, however, dealing with the displacement of the teeth can be difficult. And um, many times, once they've reached skeletal maturation, if there is still some disfigurement, they can go in and um, fix that surgically or cosmetically uh, for that particular patient. But I just saw a case, um, I guess it was last week, and there was very poor resolution of it. We typically think there's fairly good resolution of this, but that was a case that didn't end up very well. And so it was very sad to see. But typically they do fill in very nicely. And as far as the teeth being managed orthodontically, these tend to have a very good outcome for these young patients. Aneurysmal bone cyst is another thing that we can see. Um, with this, you have sudden expansion of the mandible. Uh, this is thought to be a reactive entity of vascular origin, but it can also have multinucleated giant cells as well. It, the lesions can look very, very similar to what we see with central giant cell granuloma. But the key to this is you have sudden exuberant expansion. Uh, it tends to be in the posterior mandible, and we can, of course, have our apical root resorption with that tooth displacement. And this is also one of our little buddy lesions that can show up in other entities, uh, such as in fibrous dysplasia, um, you know, if osteosarcomas, things like that. So it, it might show up in other entities. Right, here we can see it in our CT. Uh, this is a medical CT, and so we have a bone window where we can see the bone very well, and a soft tissue window where we can see the displacement of the soft tissues. You can see how grossly expansile this multilocular lesion is. All right. <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and quickly talk about our tumors. And we're going to discuss benign versus malignant. Uh, this particular uh, page kind of sums it all up and puts it all together. Um, because this is an entire lecture just in of itself, in fact, it's an entire course that you can have, um, we wanted to kind of give a synopsis of it and then talk about some of the lesions we might see with that. So with our benign lesions, when we're looking at our marginal characteristics, they're going to be well-defined, corticated, they might be sclerotic, they might be punched out, but they're very well-defined. And what does that tell us? We have the diseased tissue next to the healthy tissue and the body's been able to wall that off. And we talked about those corticated borders where the body can wall it off. Now, occasionally these can get secondarily infected. Uh, for instance, this is a secondarily infected dentigerous cyst. It actually has an oral communication to it. And we can get kind of this uh, 
I would say sclerotic thickened appearance. You don't have, you lose that beautiful corticated appearance and you get kind of a thickened sclerotic appearance to it. But that's when it is secondarily infected. Uh, it tends to have a shape. So if you are unsure about what the lesion is, if it has a shape that you learned in kindergarten, most likely it's benign. So you didn't know you were learning about pathologies way back in kindergarten. So I can say it's circular, or it's oval, um, some sort of a defined shape to it. Maybe it has a scalloped border, but you can see that there's a border to it. You can trace along that border um, very nicely. So that means it's well-defined. Any er internal architecture, it can be radiolucent or hypodense, radiopaque, hyperdense, or mixed density in appearance, multilocular or unilocular. We tend to say if it's multilocular in appearance, it is most likely benign. Now, 1% of lesions, such as um, our mucoepidermoid carcinoma, has not read our textbooks, but majority of time, if it is multilocular in appearance, it is benign. Um, effects on surrounding tissue, they can take the time to gently displace the teeth. They may cause root resorption. So here we have a horizontal root resorption. See that very nicely. This is a beautiful ameloblastoma. This is exactly what they like to do. This is a pressure resorption. So benign can cause resorption, but it's going to be a horizontal resorption. I mean, it can go ahead and displace the mandibular canal, but it's taking the time to gently displace that. It will displace the maxillary sinuses. Um, you might see some thinning and expansion of the cortical bone, but it's taking the time to expand that cortical bone. So these are all benign features. Where our malignant lesions are ill-defined or moth-eaten or invasive in appearance, and that's because they're traveling so fast that the body cannot wall this off. And so you're going to see um, destruction of your surrounding supportive bone um, it's ill-defined. I can't draw a line around it and give it a shape. We're just missing that particular anatomical feature. So malignant lesions usually have no defined shape, very irregular appearance. Internal architecture is usually radiolucent or hypodense, except in very few cases of, for example, breast cancer might be hyperdense or radiopaque prostate cancer or osteosarcoma. <clears throat> so those are our malignancies that may be radiopaque, hyperdense in appearance. What does it do on the surrounding tissue? Well, we can lose all of the surrounding supporting bone and have teeth floating in air appearance. It can cause root resorption, but it's a vertical root resorption. So you can see how that's different um, to that. And we get these spiked roots. So if you see a spiked root or a little bit concerned, and again, the reason is, is because it's traveling so fast, it doesn't take the time to finish the job. And so we'll see either spiked roots or else it won't even touch the roots at all because it's traveling so fast. It destroys the mandibular canal. So with the benign, you could see it displaced it. And with the uh, malignant, we can see it just eroded through and into the canal. You can actually see the enlargement of the canal as that um, lesion is moving along the canal. Um, it destroys any of your cortical borders, maxillary sinuses, and that sort of thing. So let's see some examples of benign and malignant. Uh, first, we're gonna start with our benign, and this is our odontoma, which is very common to see. We can have one that is called a compound odontoma. Looks like it's compounded into multiple little teeth or complex looks very irregular in appearance and we just see um, dental components. So our odontomas really could be considered a hamartoma. It's normal tissue that should be there. It's odontogenic tissue that should be there, but it is a disorganized tissue. It's more disorganized in our complex odontomas than in our compound odontomas. You'll see it's well-defined, it's corticated in appearance to it. So. These uh, do need to be removed, um, except rarely cases we see it in an 80-year-old female, then I'd probably leave it there. Um, but in our young kids, we do want to go ahead and remove these. Ameloblastoma is the most common benign tumor that you might see. Um, 
again, Hallmark features, we talked about this a little bit. It is grossly expansile when we compare it to some other things, and it likes to cause our horizontal root resorption. That's one of its key features. It can be unicystic in appearance or can be multilocular, multicystic in appearance, kind of give us, us that soap bubble appearance. It will be very expansile. So just like our dentigerous cysts like to expand, our ameloblastomas like to expand, but these also like to cause apical root resorption. Um, but again, horizontal root resorption, and this is a beautiful ameloblastoma. That's exactly what we would see to go ahead and call that. Now, these are removed by end block resection because it is an aggressive benign entity. Um, here's another example. So here we have multilocular lesion. You can see a septation right here. See that septation right there. We have expansion and thinning of the cortical borders, displacement of the teeth. We see a little bit of apical root resorption as well. Now we can sometimes get a mixed density lesion um, within a the teenage population. We tend to think of a, a teenage female. And typically these are observed when a tooth fails to erupt, such as the canine. Uh, we can see it's very well-defined, it's corticated. Internally, we actually do have some hyperdensity to it. So this is one of our odontogenic mixed density tumors. And we can have some um, calcifications that are similar to dentin or enamel within that. And of course, this does need to be removed. In the pediatric population, we can also see um, some interesting lesions, and uh, it's not something that I, I think I even remember from dental school days, but I definitely learned it when I went back and took radiology. Um, ameloblastic fibroma. So this is, again, pediatric population. We might see a well-defined, corticated hypodensity. It tends to like the posterior mandible and be associated with an unerupted tooth. And so you might think, wow, that looks maybe similar to dentigerous cyst, and that could be on your differential. But sometimes it looks like we have an ameloblastoma, but in the younger population, it could be unicystic or more multicystic in appearance. And this is our ameloblastic fibroma. It is a very benign entity. And of course, it can be um, easily um, resected uh, more conservatively. And on that spectrum, you can get an ameloblastic fibroodontoma. So this is a mixed density lesion in a child. And you can see that, yes, we do have a lot of expansion, but we have otherwise intact cortical borders. And internally, you might see this amorphous hyperdensity. And histologically, this can be of dentin or enamel origin. So there has been some discussion about whether this is a true benign tumor versus a hamartoma, but I believe this is still considered to be a true tumor. And we, of course, we do need to remove this. We have an odontogenic myxoma. This is a benign aggressive entity. It is not well-defined and corticated. It is more invasive in appearance, and it has um, kind of gelatinous material that can easily invade into the bone because it is not walled off, it's not corticated. And it's known as the great mimicker. It can look like a lot of different things. So in this particular image, you might think, whoa, that looks like osteosarcoma. That looks extremely aggressive. And they are very aggressive. Uh, but sometimes it can just look like a small periapical lesion. Now the key feature to it is we get straight septations internally with these. And it almost looks like uh, the geometric shapes you might see at the bottom of a swimming pool. It gives that kind of appearance to it. Um, these do have a high recurrence rate, and they do need to be removed with um, a large border around them. So it can be still fairly devastating. Um, here is another example of our donogenic myxoma. And again, they can look like many different things. But what we're looking for is these straight septations. This is a very unusual appearance. Usually septations are coarse and curved like we see with an ameloblastoma, but these are very straight. So they kind of meet the lesion at a 90 degree angle to it. Uh, this was thought to be a periapical lesion. They are not very expansile, but they do cause thinning and expansion of cortical borders. 
Um, they don't tend to cause a lot of apical root resorption, but again, they can be fairly devastating in the fact they need to be removed with a wide margin um, because they do have a high recurrence rate. All right, moving into some of our malignant lesions as well. Again, with malignant lesions, we just have loss and, destruct and destruction of the bone. So for example, here's a malignant lesion in the maxilla. And uh, this was actually brought in to one of our 3D courses that we did. And this was the probably the fifth CBCT this particular dentist had taken. And it was a younger individual. He just kind of walked in off the street, said, I haven't been to a dentist in five years. And something just kind of feels funny on this side. Um, of course, when he took the uh, CBCT, he brought it into us. He said, I just don't see anything on this side. That tends to be a really bad sign. If you don't see anything on that side, it has been destroyed. So when we're looking at this, and we can use symmetry, so don't forget to use symmetry if you're not sure what you're looking at. We see the orbit on one side, but we've lost the cortical borders of the orbit on the other side. We can see the maxillary sinus on one side, but it's missing on the other side. We see the alveolar bone on one side, but really missing on the other side. The tooth kind of looks like it's hanging out in space. Same with the nasal fossa. I can see my nasal fossa on one side, but again, the other side, I really can't see it. And whatever this is, is starting to expand through or erode through the nasal septum as well. And when we look at it, we really can see that we've lost all cortical borders heading right into brain. Uh, so this ended up being a pleomorphic sarcoma, <clears throat> which is a very rare entity. It is a very aggressive soft tissue sarcoma. And obviously we're seeing the destruction of the cortical border. So if you don't see anything, we start to worry about a malignancy because those borders have been destroyed. Um, it doesn't take the time to expand things typically. Although so this was a very atypical metastatic breast cancer. So of course I'm gonna show you the atypical case, right? Um, so of course, if a patient's had breast cancer, we tend to think of a lot of things if they come in with this type of appearance. We can think of um, you know, bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaws, and that's certainly what they thought about in this case because we have some expansion, not just destruction, but we have some expansion. And so this was thought to be an osteomyelitis. And yet when the patient came back three months later, it had very aggressively developed and started to expand down through the bone, and this ended up being a metastatic breast cancer. So this is, this is an unusual case. We tend to just see the destruction of the cortical borders and loss of cortical borders, but occasionally it can do things like this. Uh, this is a much more typical appearance to what we see with our malignancies, is that you're just missing those cortical borders. So as you come down through your axial sections, you'll notice we've just lost cortical borders. And this was a central squamous cell carcinoma, a very unusual case of a squamous cell carcinoma that was centrally within the bone and not peripherally. In fact, this patient is a 30-year-old male, non-smoker, and he came in through the endodontic department, and the complaint was he was kicked in the face by a horse, and then his teeth became loose. And that's what brought him in. Uh, but we can clearly see that we do have a moth-eaten appearance and loss of those cortical borders. All right, I think this is our last one. Uh, this is an osteosarcoma. I uh, can definitely see, I, don't know what, I think I have a few more, but we can see destruction of those cortical borders, uh, definitely destruction of the cortical borders when we compare with the other side, and the lesion starting to produce a calcification within it. Very, very typical of our osteosarcomas. This is our nice sun ray spiculated appearance. But just know that only about 30% of the lesions actually show this gorgeous spiculated appearance to it, letting us know it's an osteosarcoma. So you definitely can pay attention to all of the destruction of the cortical borders and say, yes, this is definitely malignant. This needs to go on. And then we showed a couple of atypical ones, but ones I wanna talk about real quickly. Uh, you can get malignancies other places. So it's important to view your entire volume. Uh, this was a malignancy in the clivus. Um, most likely a chordoma, and we have erosion of cortical borders and Apache sclerosis to it. And here's what it looks like in a CT. And these patients tend to come in 
progressive headache, diplopia, sensory deficit, numbness in the face. You may not see them. They may you know, go directly to their doctors, but you might see them. They might think they have something wrong that's a tooth issue. And what you'll see is a large lesion <coughs> with our medical CTs, but what we can see with our CBCTs is loss of cortical borders and destru destruction and a patchy sclerosis. So this, of course, would need to go on for additional imaging. And this would be the additional imaging that we would see. The other thing is you might see malignancy in the cervical spine if your CBCT is large enough. And so what does that look like? Well, we get these multiple lytic lesions throughout the spine and a patchy bony sclerosis. So these three are multiple myeloma, and this one's a metastatic breast cancer. So if you see a patchy bony sclerosis throughout your visualization of the cervical spine and the patient has a history of cancer, we wanna send them back to their oncologist for additional imaging. And this was a very extreme case of metastatic lung cancer. And you'll notice that the vertebra, um, they call it an ivorine vertebra. You really don't see any more of the trabecular bone. It looks very, very white to it. And this was a metastatic lung cancer. All right, with that, we are going to go ahead and end this evening. Um, let's see, I don't know, I didn't know exactly how long we would have or how much talking I would do, but evidently I talk quite a lot. <laughs> so I would just say thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, there is my email and my website and feel free to send me any questions if you think of something later on or you're not sure what you're looking at. Um, yeah. Any questions? Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, it looks like we do have one question. Nathan asked, do you have any guidance to help differentiate between a carotid artery calcification versus a silith? Sorry about that pronunciation. Oh, that's okay. And actually, <laughs> I was hoping we'd have a little bit of time to get to that. Um, I did put in some incidental findings just in case, but um, it's probably more important that we talk about the actual lesions. So a calcified carotid atheroma is going to be at the C3, C4 level. And it's the same level that we tend to see calcified tritetial cartilage or thyroid cartilage at. And it's at the level of the hyoid bone. So if you're at the hyoid bone, you already know you're at the C3, C4 level. So you can use that hyoid bone to help you. If you see, for instance, a calcification that's medial and inferior to the hyoid bone, most likely calcified um, tritetial or thyroid cartilage, but if you see it lateral and posterior to the hyoid bone at that C3, C4 level, we're going to start to think about a calcified carotid atheroma. And especially by the time you see this beautiful arcuate appearance, you can see that calcification is rimming that artery. We know that's a calcified carotid atheroma. If we're looking at it in our coronal sections, it might look like train tracks. So you notice it has that kind of train track appearance to it. And of course it can look um, more linear in our sagittal sections, but what we're really seeing is the bifurcation of the common carotid. So that tends to be where you have a high degree of turbulence and it tends to be where we see calcified carotid atheromas. So that is our calcified carotid atheromas. Great, thank you. Get another question. Um, does simple bone cyst affect nerve pain through the bone? Typically it doesn't. A simple bone cyst um, tends to be an incidental finding. Um, they is not something you tend to see pain with. <clears throat> Although if it, if it gets infected, if the area gets kind of infected, you can have some pain, um, but it tends not to. So. If you have pain with that, we might start thinking about something else. But the oral surgeon will know right away when they get into it exactly what it is because a simple bone cyst is just an empty cavity within the bone that we won't have anything in it. There's no, um, well, there's no epithelial lining to it. I can't say it doesn't have nothing in it or uh, occasionally it'll have fluid. So I, I take back that one back. Occasionally it'll have fluid, but it's basically an empty cavity. Awesome. Hopefully that answers your question. Great. Yeah. And if anyone else has any questions, feel free to type in the box labeled, have a question on the right side of your screen. 
wait a few more minutes. And if not, um, we'll definitely get those questions answered for you guys. Awesome. Well, it looks like we covered everything for tonight. Um, thank you again so much for a wonderful presentation. We did record thank tonight's you. webinar and we'll email out the recording sometime in the next week. And we would appreciate everyone's feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you again awesome. for joining us and we look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending your evening with me. Thank you. Good night. Good night.